This is, of course, the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John, based on the commentary of Elder Athanasius and Telineos. And we are in lesson four, the, the one who is and was and is coming. Let's begin by looking at the sacred text. Revelation 1, 4 to 6. I'll read it in Greek and then we'll go to the English and we'll look at some slight differentiations in the basic, uh, uh, two of the basic uh, English texts that circulate and then we'll jump into the analysis. Ioannis tis epta ecclesias tisentin asia. Charis min kirini apo on Κεοίν και ο ερχόμενο. Και από τον επτά πνευμάτων αενόπιον του θρόνου αυτού. Και από Ιησού Χριστού, ο Μάρτη, ο Πιστό, ο Πρωτότοκο των Νεκρών. Και ο Άρχον των Βασιλέων τη Γη. Το αγαπώντι ημά και λύσαντι ημά εκ των αμαρτιών ημών εν το αίματι αυτού. Και επίση είναι η μα βασιλεία, η ρίστο Θεό και πατρίδα αυτού. Αυτό η δόξα και το κράτο ει του αιώνα των αιώνων. Αμήν. Now in King James, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So just before we move on to looking at another English translation, some differences, Let's pay attention, even for those who aren't well-versed in ancient Greek, pay attention to the key phrases which we're going to examine tonight. So the first black, uh, bold in text, we see the famous oon. And those who are familiar with Orthodox icons will remember this phrase, and I will talk about this shortly afterwards. This phrase uh, uh, or word oon uh, is above the... Uh, the Lord's head in the cross, uh, in the halo around the, in the icons of Christ. Uh, and it is variously translated as, uh, well, here we have from hitch, from, from him which is, uh, we also have the one who is, we also have the one who has been, the one who exists, the existing one. In fact, at the, at the end of Vespers, we have, uh, this phrase, the, he who exists or he, the, the ever-existing one, there's various translation. Uh, and then we have oin, oin, which was, it's past tense, and oerkomenos, which is to come. Uh, and these phrases will be analyzed uh, shortly. We're also going to look at the phrases pertaining to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in particular, o martis o pistos, the faithful witness. You'll see martis, uh, which is, the, of course, uh, uh, you'll, you'll think of the term martyr in English, which is from this phrase, and it's in English, in Greek, as we'll say shortly, the same word for both witness and martyr. Uh, so o martis o pistos, the faithful witness, the one who is faithful in his testimony, in his martyrdom uh, to the truth. And then, o prototokos ton nekron, the firstborn or first begotten of the dead. And then I did not uh, put in black uh, bold, but I should have. O archon ton vasileon disgis, and the prince or king, uh, or uh, ruler, uh, it's probably a better translation. Uh, archon is uh, uh, the one who rules, the one uh, uh, yeah, basically the ruler over the people, the archon, the prince or ruler of the kings of the earth. That's where we'll stop tonight. We'll look through those two lines, basically four and five, and we'll look at six next week. So let's look again uh, at this. Uh, we have King James on the right, but over on the left, we have some slight differences. Just want to make you aware of that. And we'll be using uh, interchangeably these texts in our analysis. 
So we have from him, uh, which actually, if you noticed, uh, or you actually, it's not in this version of the Greek, but it will be in the the, the original Greek version, the one used in the Orthodox Church. We don't have from him actually, we from from God, uh, from God who is. Uh, but both English translations and most English translations uh, done for the most part by the Protestant world, uh, whether papal or reformed, uh, they um, translated it from him uh, who is and who was and who is to come, which is slightly different than the uh, King James, which which is, not who is, uh, not an essential difference. And then Christ, the faithful witness, it says here, uh, which is essentially the same, the firstborn as opposed to the first begotten of the dead. And here they have ruler instead of uh, prince. Uh, these are the differences, slight variations, and we'll talk about some of these going forward. So God, according to the Greek text, uh, as you see here, Revelation 1.4, the Byzantine majority, so-called Byzantine majority Greek text, the Greek version, does have the word for God, Theos, uh, and so that's what you'll find in here if, if reading, uh, we were reading uh, in the context of the liturgical life in the scriptures, which we don't uh, have not for quite some time in the Orthodox Church. Maybe that will return, God willing. But in any case, that is what you hear from texts coming down through the Orthodox Church, apotheu. And so this word God here is going to be basically explained by the rest what which god what's the god we're talking about who is and who was and who is to come so the words who is and was and who is to come is the explanation of the word god who is god who who is god who was god and who, who is coming all of these uh describe the one god and then this of course takes us back immediately for all all of us who have familiar with the Old Testament, uh, there'll be several references actually in Genesis and Isaiah, but the most famous that comes to mind, and this will happen throughout the reading of the book of Revelation, you'll see us going back again and again to the prophets because this book cannot be understood without the prophets. We cannot really understand the book without the prophets. Um, so I'm seeing that we're having some technical difficulties I don't really know what I can do about that. I've tried my best. Um, so choppy here, it says it's frozen. Yeah, it's coming in and out apparently. And I apologize for that. Hopefully we won't have any other issues. Okay, John says it's fine, good. That's good. All right, yeah, let me know uh, in the uh, chat if, if there's some issues, John, I'll try to keep my mind uh, uh, of Keep that in mind as we go forward. All right. So going back to the text, this is now, uh, if we call to mind, there will be many, as I said, many passages from the Old Testament that we're going to be going back to. Uh, of course, the New Testament as well. It's so, uh, of course, St. John is so well versed in all of the prophetic uh, tradition and witness. And so, Oon, we remember this is exactly how he, the Lord, spoke to Moses in in response to his question, who is this? Uh, and God uh, God said to Moses, I am that I am. In other words, ego e mi on. Ego e mi on. Ipero theos pros to Moisin, legon. Ego e mi on. And God said to Moses, I am that I am. That's one version. You also have, I am the being, the existing one. And then there's also, I am the one who is, who exists. All of these are attempts at translation of the Greek. Uh, the truth is that the Greek is very unique. It's very kind of unusual. Uh, it doesn't really follow, uh, as, as Elder Athanas points out, the grammar, the typical grammar, but it's intentional. It's an intentional diversion in order to drive home uh, the, uh, uh, the uniqueness uh, that we have in front of us. So... This is uh, the identification of the God of the people of Israel. This You could not be any clearer in saying that the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel and the revelation that he's giving is the same Lord of heaven and earth, the same Lord of the people of Israel, the same Lord, the Alpha and the Omega, 
uh, et cetera. So uh, that's uh, an important point to understand this book. There are many, many references in this book that point us to the authenticity, and this is one of them, shows us the continuity and the harmony with the Old Testament. Now, there are different ways to talk about these three phrases. They're not um, one-dimensional. There's various readings. We have various readings right in the, the commentary of St. Andrew. There are various readings. Uh, he commemorates uh, another commentator, and then he gives a different uh, view a little bit later, uh, probably his own. Uh, and Elder Athanasius sees the things in a multifaceted, multi-level way as well. And it's perfectly acceptable because that's how the nature of scripture. It's not one dimensional. There are many levels to it. So on one hand, we could say that all three apply to the Father. In another hand, we could say that all three apply to the whole Holy Trinity. And another way we could say that each one is pointing out more particularly the three persons one after another. And so the reading that is predominant for a variety of reasons is the who is is referring to the first and foremost to the Father. The who was is referring to the Son, and this reminds us, uh, we're reminded of John 1.1 1, 1, when he says, in the beginning, and he, he means of creation, was the Word, who was in the beginning, right? We have that witness from the same writer, John the Apostle, an evangelist, so that points us to the Son. And then we have who is coming, and this refers to the paraclete, the Paraclete, meaning, of course, the parakletos in Greek, which is the, translated oftentimes as the comforter. So the Holy Spirit. And we see that the Holy Spirit is the one who came uh, and is continually coming to the people of God. So in a sense, he stayed in the church and he makes the children of God holy by baptism. And of course, all the mysteries of the church, which in which God is gives, gives and is given. So um, we have these three witnesses and these three explanations for the three phrases, but we're going to go on and look at them more particularly now. Another aspect to these phrases is that they point out that God is above, in and above and over uh, all time. So we and see in these three that they include the totality of time. And this is Elder Athanasio speaking here. They include the present, who is, who is now and always exists, always existed. Includes the past, the present, and the future. Who is, the present, who was, the past, and who is coming, the future. This shows that God not only moves through time, but he, is also, uh, he also transcends time. God is beyond, outside of past, present, and future. For God, there is no time. God created time. And this is what John wishes to show with his phrase, that God is over and above time. So he, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is coming is also teaching us that God is over and above time. And this is not a small matter whatsoever. We actually have heresies that have tripped over this teaching and cannot understand the nature of the providence of God. So many times people uh, need to remember and don't uh, that um, the nature of the providence of God is that God is not within limits, limits of time. He's not like us who are bound by time and space. So he sees everything as now. There is no past and present and future for him. It's all just reality. So everything that happened, ha happening now and hap will happen for God is already seen, it's already apparent. And so he doesn't predetermine, but he foresees. He sees it all before it happens. And he arranges everything according to his providence for our salvation. Uh, if, you can, if we could venture a very poor example, but something that might help us a little bit to understand just how uh, the eternal perspective is, and how vastly superior it is to us ability to see unless we enter into his mind and acquire his mind then things change as in the lives of the saints but for us who are earthbound spacebound timebound passionate people uh, our vision would be something like walking on the on the earth 
and seeing whatever we can see at ground level, whatever's around us, however far we can see. Yeah, I'm mine's showing up as, as being delayed. I hope to God it's not the case, but uh, apparently, hope that's not the case. Okay. If you back um, looks like we're back John okay let me get back to where we were and we'll pick up so forgive us for the interrupt in interruption um, uh, and here we want to be. So we're again, we were talking about. All right, we were talking about. Sorry about that. We were talking about. This is not showing up over here, though. Why is that? Are you guys back? Okay, you see me now? For some reason. There we go. We're back. All right. So our vision is we're, we're, we're ground level. Right? We can only see so far so much. Uh, but the Lord, if you can imagine, is from the eternal, from this perspective of the highest point possible into the sky, into the into the air. He sees everything in context. He sees things that are far beyond and far beyond. Uh, and, and so this is the struggle for all of us who want to have the mind of Christ and enter in, is to obtain the eternal not be bound by the limitations of our vision on this earth, which means an earthbound, passionate kind of life, but to be to ascend, to be essentially at the right hand of the Father in his as the Lord sits with his with his human nature. He wants us to ascend with him spiritually. He wants us to look at things and see things always in the perspective of eternal life, to stand with the eschatological, as it were, stands constant, not just seeking that which is to come, but already having a progressy, a, a, a foretaste, uh, living the, the marriage, the eternal marriage of the soul with God. So that there's many coming in and out tonight. I don't know what's happening. And to do with uh, the admiring the uh, divine perspective, and so this is what's seen here: that our Lord is outside of time, and yet throughout time and in time, He comes and dwells uh, again with us. Now, so He is both outside of time, but He's also within human history at the same time. And interestingly, long before Christ. We have a witness of the um, we have a witness of this truth even in the, among the philosophers in Aristotle. Since that he says in his Metaphysics seven, he says since that which moves and is moved is intermediate, there is something which moves without being moved. The famous 
uh, unmoved mover of Aristotle. And he has a tr he has discovered a truth here. Because he says, as he says here, it's being it's eternal, it's substance, and it's sexuality. And this is the way God is, because God is everywhere and he fills all things. He's everywhere and he fills all things. His presence covers every single point in the universe. It is not possible for him to move, right? Because he is everywhere and fills all things, as we say in the prayer of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of every divine service in the Orthodox Church. Movement suggests the occupation of a new area of space that was not previously occupied, but that's not true with God. Uh, as we all understand, God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere, and so he does not need to come and go. This come and go of God, who is coming, as it says in the scripture, refers to the incarnation of God, the Theanthropos. And so he is everywhere present in Philip's all things. He, he came into history before there was creation. He was. He came into history and he has departed from history and yet he comes again. So this coming and going is the presence of the incarnation and the continuation of the incarnation in the church. So it's a both and as usual. And you've heard me say that a thousand one times, both and. And I'm going back and forth, making sure that I'm not getting cut out again. It's, I don't know what to do except to keep teaching. Forgive us. I don't know what our problem is tonight. Trying our best. So the coming and going of God in history refers to the human nature of God. And he goes and he says in John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. This is, of course, in the Gospel of John. So this, the once at one and the same time, we have him coming into history, of course, with the incarnation, we have him departing and taking the human nature, uh, our human nature to the right hand of God in his ascension, but then coming again uh, in, on Pentecost and remaining with us, and then coming again, the second coming, uh, but this coming is always, as it were, happening. It's outside of time. So the one who is always coming is understood here. Oon or Homenos. Oon is the one who always exists, who was, who always was, right? So actually, when he comes in and out of time, it doesn't mean that he ceases to exist or comes into existence. Uh, he's always coming, always present, always was. Uh, he makes the appearance in, in, in the time and space, and it seems as, as to us as if he's coming and going, uh, but it's one and the same. It's both and. It's both he's always here, and yet he's coming. It's a mystery beyond our comprehension. Uh, there are special cases, of course, in history with the Incarnation and and it's seen in Scripture, for instance, in Hebrews 10.37. For yet a little while, he says, and he shall he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And so this is pointing to uh, the second coming, of course. And then, as the elder says himself, the one who is always coming will come. What does this mean? It means that God is always within our history. He sees the entire world, the entire universe is in God's hands. But when it says he will get here, it refers to the special appearances of God, the word. Jesus Christ. So we have this paradox, which is so central to our life in the church. And we sing at every great feast, today he is crucified. Today he is resurrected. Today he is born, right? Today we have the entrance into the temple. And that is true because he's both in at once in time and out of time. And those events are timeless. They took on a timeless nature because he was the one that was carrying those events out. It was to him that was that they were happening and he was uh, guiding them. And so they become, as it were, both in and outside of time. And so we enter into these timeless events in the church. This is the this is what happens in the divine liturgy. We, we don't, the divine liturgy is not something that happens on earth alone. It actually happens in heaven. In, in other words, we earthbound creatures that we are, 
at the same time are ascending to the heaven. And that of the throne of God is where everything is taking place. So it's this both and that, that we can see uh, throughout history. And that double, as it were, uh, existence uh, in and outside of time. Now, there's, there's of course, a rational approach to the things of God, which are very, is very limited, but not entirely useless. But then there's that which surpasses the rational, logical uh, categories. And so there's a divine mathematics, as it were. And this is something where, unfortunately, some Christians, or people who seek to follow Christ, and the heterodox confessions especially, have really fallen into a, a trap, and they've fallen into a, a log following the logical, rational philosophers, and they've fallen away from the basic truth of the gospel. Now listen carefully, because this is very important, this whole section now that we're going to go into is very, very important. It touches on a lot of things that are essential and for most of us converts to the faith, this will be new territory. And so it's important for us to pay attention. Uh, again, if I, if there's a problem with the connection, I, Timothy or John, just quickly write me a note here uh, so that I, I know. Uh, yeah. So every few minutes for only about five to 10 seconds. Yeah, I don't know what to do. It's, it's not really in my control. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully that will not continue. All right. So this is very important. Now we go to the second part of the lecture, which is going to be looking at this, uh, this part of the uh, sacred text where we have in Greek again, apotaun eptap nevmaton aenopion to throno aftu kepo isu christu. Let me uh, cut that. That's, that might help. Uh, and from the seven spirits, uh, which are before the, his throne, and from Jesus Christ. So what are these seven spirits? Right? What are these seven spirits that are being referred to? And there's a variety of interpretations. Uh, so the seven spirits which are before his throne. First of all, the seven spirits understood properly foremostly in the script in the uh, patristic tradition is the whole is the holy spirit seven equals one in this divine mathematics seven equals one the throne of god of course refers to god the father so around the throne of god the seven spirits as it were wait and come and go and minister uh to the salvation of humanity, the seven spirits meaning the grace uh, energies of God. And the seven it represents the fullness and the perfection of the Holy Spirit. And we see this in the Old Testament. We see this in the Old Testament very clearly, and it's commemorated here again in uh, the uh, book of Revelation. So from the prophet Isaiah's sevenfold declaration of the attributes of the gifts or the energies of the one Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read it in, in, in Greek, and then I'm going to give you the two versions in English and talk about why we have a slight uh, um, uh, difference in, uh, in the uh, English. And it has to do with the original text, the Septuagint, or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Hebrew text. So it says there in Hebrew, in uh, Isaiah 11, 2 to 3, Kiana pafsite epafton pnevma to theu. Pnevma Sophias, que senesios. Pnevma volis, que esquios. Pnevma nosios, que evsevias. Emblisi afton pnevma fovothiu. In the English, the King James, or actually the Septuagint version first. And the Spirit of God shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and strength. The Spirit of knowledge and godliness shall fill him the spirit of the fear of God. Uh, in King James, we have a slight difference because we don't, we're not coming from the Septuagint. And in fact, it ends up being a six plus one in terms of the number uh, of the, the, the seven spirits, slightly, obs uh, obs slightly obscured here in the King James. And I'm reading in the last text at the bottom. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, 
and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Well, we don't have that in the Septuagint. We have Evsevius, uh, godliness or piety, could be translated, uh, even devotion, uh, reverence, uh, the fear of the Lord. And then it says, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. So this is a difference. And I think this is one of many, many examples of why the Orthodox Church has never used the Masoretic or the Hebrew text, because uh, there's some pretty major discrepancies. Uh, there are seven spirits, not the fear is fear is commemorated here twice. So actually, we don't have we don't even have seven. We have six in the King James Version uh, translation from from the Hebrew. So the Septuagint keeps it. The translation we have from Brenton, which is about 150 years old, 130 year old translation. Uh, not not so great of a translation, but of course better than the Masoretic. So uh, these seven spirits are the one Holy Spirit, and we don't have seven different Holy Spirits. We don't have seven, uh, uh, you know, persons of the Holy Spirit. Right? This is the energies, not the essence. That we're talking about what is manifested the operations so to speak of the holy spirit in the world so this divine mathematics i want you to remember uh you know three uh one plus one plus one is one right the father son and holy spirit one god uh the seven spirits are one spirit the holy spirit and elder athanasio says here all the attributes of the holy spirit are reflected in the prayers and hymns the day of the cost to honor the holy spirit same holy spirit the undivided holy spirit divides the gifts this is extremely important the undivided holy spirit divides the gifts but the spirit remains one and indivisible so the holy spirit is expressed with the term the seven spirits but again as we see it is one holy spirit one holy spirit one and indivisible, and yet divides. This is the mystery. We're going to talk a lot about this in the next couple, about seven or eight slides here. Because it's extremely important, because unfortunately in the West, following the philosophers and not the Holy Fathers, the scholastics, with their extreme focus on divine simplicity and not understanding the actions of the Holy Spirit, they, they fell away from this, this strict uh, teaching of the Holy Fathers regarding the energies and the essence of God. And that had lots of consequences, bad consequences. So today, it is, um, for instance, in, in what I can speak to most authoritatively, it is behind a false ecclesiology of the Vatican II, for instance, the Second Vatican Council, and their understanding of the Holy Spirit in and, with, and outside the church appears to be in, in great ignorance of the patristic teaching as to the energies uh, and essence of God. Let's read. Let's read this uh, uh, tripartium, this hymn from the Feast of Pentecost, which is referenced by uh, Elder Athanasius. We have here uh, Bishop. Uh, I want to. I forget his name right now, but he is maybe somebody remembers. He's from Palestine. He's. I think he's the only. Arabic bishop in the patriarchy right now. Anyway, he's kneeling in front of the tomb of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, the Holy Sepulchre, on the day of Pentecost in the evening when the Holy Orthodox Church uh, calls upon in three long and very beautiful prayers uh, for the descent of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the so-called kneeling prayers. So you have a picture here of, uh, of the successor of the apostles kneeling at the, at the, at the tomb of our Lord and calling upon uh, the uh, descent of the Holy Spirit. And one of the Traparion, which is very expressive of the Orthodox theology, is here in Greek and English. I'll read it in Greek first and in English. Uh, and I know some of you say, well, I don't know Greek. Why does he keep reading Greek? It's good to hear the Greek. It's good to see the Greek. It's good to remember and for us to explain more fully these terms because they're not always uh, well represented in, in English, right? So we're going to get a deeper and better understanding if we see the original text, which is uh, which is referenced in the um, church fathers and in the church tradition. So on the right, we'll read this Traparion, and then we'll go to the left afterwards and, and talk about some of the, the, the phrases used. 
το πνεύμα του Άγιον. Maybe I'll do it. What we'll do is we'll go back and forth so that we don't have to read it in two different ways. So I'll, I'll translate again back and forth, and that'll help maybe for all of us to better understand the Greek and it and go deeper. Το πνεύμα του Άγιον, the Holy Spirit. He's saying in Greek it's the Spirit, the Holy. Το πνεύμα του Άγιον, φως, light. Kezui life. Kezui. Zosa pigi noera, and living fountain of spiritual gifts. So that's a bit of um, an interpretation on the English version. Zosa, living source pigi noera, uh, is is noetic. Uh, so they're they're taking it down as spiritual gifts. Doesn't really say spiritual gifts, but it it's true. It's accurate. Zosa living. Uh, and that's, of course, the Holy Spirit himself is the source of all the gifts of the spirit or the, uh, the noetic uh, life of man, right? The, the life of the, of the noose in the heart of man, the, the spirit of man. Pnevma Sophias, the spirit of wisdom. Pnevma Sinesios, the spirit of understanding. Spirit of, um, yeah, understanding. Agathon, he is good. The spirit is good. Ephthes, it's upright. It's straightforward. It's upright. Noiron, it's intelligent, but not a rational intelligence here, but a noetic intelligence. Noiron. Igemonevon, it is ruling, right? It rules, it's in, in charge. It's the term igumenos, which we have as abbot, comes from this term, for instance. The ruling intellect. Katheron uh, taptesmata. Uh, he purifies us from our sins. He cleanses the... Tesmata is not actually amartias. Amartias would be sin. Tesmata is um, slightly less. Tesmata. Uh, he cleanses us from all of our sin. Transgressions might be... Uh, Better translation for Tesmata. Theos ke Theopion. Theos, yeah, thank you, uh, Raphael. Bishop Theodosius, Hannah. Thank you. That's who we're that's who's in the picture here. Bishop Theodosius Hannah from Palestine. Thank you. Uh Theos ke Theopion. God. Um, well, this translation is a little bit off. The spirit is the deifying God. Uh it, it literally says God and the and the God making or God creating the deifying God, the one who deifies, the one who makes, came as St. Athanasius the Great says, God became man so that man might become God, right? God by grace, of course, not by essence. So Theos, que Theopion, Pir, Pir is fire. Ek Piros, from fire, fire proceeding from fire. Pion, Ekpiros pio, proion, sorry, ekpiros proion. Uh, so the the result of fire. So fire from that which is from fire, proceeding from fire, perhaps is one way. Lalun, speaking. Energun, acting. Dierun tacharismata. This is very important. Trans, they translate it as distributing gifts, but dierun is literally dividing. Dierun is dividing, so dividing the gifts. So this is very important because we have, this is the Orthodox Phronium and teaching, which is not acceptable to the scholastic, legalistic minds uh, in certain academic theolo theological circles to this day in the West, the idea that there could be division in the graces, right? I mean, yes, on one, one level they do accept it, but on a deeper level there's problems and misunderstandings. Diu uh, profite apandas by the spirit of the prophets, by all of the prophets, uh, the divine apostles, kethiu uh, apostoli, the apostles of God, meta martiron esteftisan, and the martyrs were crowned. Uh, together with the martyrs, they were crowned. And then it's this wonderful. If you've heard the Tripari in, in, in Byzantine chant, it's especially expressive. Xenon akusma. Strange is this report. Uh, 
strange to the ears, strange to the ears, literally, akusma. Xenon theama, it's a strange uh, sight. Uh, what, what is a xenon, what is, what is a strange to the ears, strange to the sight? Pir dierumenon is nomas charismaton. Pir, of course, the Holy Spirit, the Divine Spirit, is divided. For what reason? To distribute the gifts, for the granting of the gifts, right? This is phenomenal. I mean, I, I wish I, I wish we could all feel deeply how important this teaching is today to understand how the grace of God works in our life, but also how it is different in the church from those outside the church. There are many right now, among even Orthodox Christians, who are stumbling and tripping because they cannot understand the distinctions of the energies of the grace of God, not only in creation and in the providence, but between inside the church and outside the church. In other words, before and after baptism, before and after initiation. And this has tremendous ne negative consequences in our self-understanding as Orthodox and our understanding of the heterodox and our understanding of the need to be initiated, to be baptized, to be chrismated. This teaching, which is I, I, we presented here at Orthodox Ethos several times. If you want to go deeper, uh, in about a month and a half ago, we reposted, I think, uh, the, the teaching that we've done on St. Maximus the Confessor and his understanding of this, this, these energies and how they work and how they uh, deify and what are the presuppositions for this deification. Uh, but you can see right here on the feast day of Pentecost, and you can see it here in the book of Revelation. It's everywhere, but it, people are blind to to it because they don't have the presupposition many times to understand it. So beautiful. Hopefully this has been good for you, been helpful to hear it in Greek, to see it in English, and also to, uh, to understand uh, that this mystery, the church consciously stands before it and is in awe of it, confessing it at the same time, saying that this is how it is. One Holy Spirit, many gifts, many energies, many operations for the sake of the salvation of mankind. So how do we interpret, now this one of the questions comes out, well, how do we interpret these things? And this is actually, I've been um, been on social media and through YouTube been answering a lot of questions the last couple of days of people who've tripped and fallen, whether they be Orthodox who are confused or those who've, uh, who are uh, Protestants and, uh, and, are, and are struggling. They, um, they've tripped and fallen over this, uh, this question of the scriptures and proper interpretation and who and how we interpret. Well, one of the basic principles of interpretation is that the Holy Spirit interprets the Holy Spirit. What do we mean? Scripture interprets Scripture. The Holy Fathers oftentimes are showing us the meaning of Scripture by other passages of Scripture and showing the continuity of this meaning throughout the Old and New Testament. And the same is, is apparent here. So we have this witness, of course, of the seven spirits, but we don't just have it in the book of Revelation. Uh, we have it also in the Old Testament. We have it in the book of Revelation in several places. Let's read a few of those, uh, and then we'll move on to the old, some Old Testament uh, references as well. Where do we find the seven, scripture, seven spirits in Holy Scripture? Well, we see it in Revelation 3.1. And under the angel of the church of in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. And again in Revelation 5.6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Uh, so we can start to begin to understand these various passages when we understand the seven spirits, meaning the energies of the, of the Holy Spirit uh, that are sent throughout creation for the salvation of, of, of creation and for mankind. And again, in Revelation 4, 5, out of the throne proceeded lightings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven lights, seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God. Another, another, let's say, vantage point to this mystery of the divine seven spirits of God. Uh, and so the elder says, so he is the one who has the fullness of the uncreated energies, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he sends them out to the world. 
these are great and awesome images which show how the spirit of god as grace and energies is perfection it's commemorated it's commemorated in the old testament as seven but it's much more than seven it's a symbolic it's seven, but of course it's more it's it's more uh, multiplied much more. It shows the multitude of gifts and that the Spirit of God comes laden with the gifts for the world. So this is the action of the Spirit of God in the world. To give the gift of the Spirit, charisma, right, where we get charisms, charisma, uh, and for their salvation, for their union, as a fruit of union and as a, as a path to union as well. Uh, this is the way the whole works. And if you know this, I mean, the experience that you've seen this in the lives of the saints is everything. Because you over the sinfulness of men who are called Christians who fall because of the, the, the variety of reasons, passions and arrogance and pride, and they do sinful things. Uh, and men have seen actions lives of this and therefore just away from the life of the church on account of those who have uh who to the gifts of god so when you have experience of course you become solidified in the life of the church solidified and and in, immovable in the devotion to the extremely extremely important all right let's move on to Next slide. And, okay. There is great consistency in the book of Revelation, consistency with the Old Testament and the and the uh, the prophets. But just one example here in terms of the imagery, the understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have an issue. And it says that the Appearance with burn and like the appearance of lamps. And that living and the fire was bright and out of the fire. So we have this uh, some similarity to what we see here the burning uh, uh, coal, and coals of fire, of course. This is this likeness that mystery right just we have many images in scripture of the action of the whole of them are attempts at a mystery which would be a uh, description so we talk about the tongues of fire we talk about of descending the around the uh, apo- the uh, prophets at the mount of tabor and uh, uh many others uh, the still small voice uh uh and any other these of course attempts to describe this mystery of the spirit of god in the lives of the saints prince of lamps like burning coals of fire right they're not actually burning coals they're not lamps themselves uh, the seven lamps around the throne of god are not lamps themselves right they don't have oil in them but they're they're describing the spiritual mystery and out of the fire went forth lightning etc this this fire was bright. All this reminds us and, 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 and is consistent with our description in the book of Revelation. So Elder Athanasius says, those revolving blazing lamps show that the Holy Spirit penetrates everywhere, knows all, and that there is nothing that escapes the Holy Spirit. See how the elder interprets this? He goes right to the heart of the thing and says, what's the spiritual element here? What, what does this mean for us spiritually? Well, it means that there is... He is present everywhere and fill us all things. We the same prayers that we say in the church today, uh, and he knows all. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent, uh, and there's nothing that escapes. There's no place. There's no time. There's no space that he is not. He's everywhere present and fill us all things. Uh, so the spirit of God is is before the throne of God as seven spirits because of its ability to. Uh, 
to permeate is what should should have been not permeate permeate so that's what that permeation that filling all things is what is being described there uh before the throne of god the seven spirits the lord says the holy spirit searches the deep things of god in other words he is god for who can search the deep things of god but god uh so that is a description of god himself he who searches the deep things of god he is god himself there are seven spirits of god all of them are the holy spirit and the prophet Ezekiel says this, as we saw beautifully, illustrating the consistency of the Old and New Testament. You can see that on uh, page 53 or 59 if you have the first edition of the commentary by Elder Athanasius, and he says more there uh, as well. So here we're going to stop a second, and we're going to talk about this patristic teaching in a minute, uh, and then we'll move on. And I want to drive it home that what we have here, this undivided Holy Spirit, which is dividing the gifts, right? And we have this particularly important patristic saying, which is exactly describing this mystery in the scriptures that we're talking about. And it's extremely important, and it's shared by several fathers. Let's hear, this is an excerpt from my book, The Ecclesiological Innovation of Vatican II, Chapter 10. Uh, so just going to read from that, and we'll comment on it. But it's right on top topic here, so I think it'll be helpful. In the tradition of the church, a distinction is made between God's essence and energies. All right? God's essence and energies. And although the two are often contrasted, it is understood that the energy is the natural energy of the essence or an essential energy. It's an essential energy. Not, these aren't, these are, um, you know, oftentimes... Um, we get stuck on these distinctions, but they're just distinctions to, for us to understand the working of God. We should, should not become excessively committed to these distinctions as if they're not only notionally, right? We make notional distinctions, which are extremely important for us because they are boundaries and keep us within the truth, but they themselves should not be considered to, um, to empty as it were, the meaning, as if they could encapsulate all the meaning. They're just essentially the least possible, right? The, be, as as St. Gregory Theologian says, um, if you can, um, how does he say it? Uh, if you can describe to me how the Father is uh, without cause, I will describe to you how the Spirit, the spirit proceeds. <laughs> so kind of mockingly saying, these things are beyond us, right? But But what we have is extremely important and that's been revealed to us and so we have to keep those boundaries because if you go outside those boundaries then you end end up contradicting the revelation and you fall away from the truth of god and god will not dwell with you the spirit of god will not dwell within you it's a matter of salvation that we understand and confess properly what's been revealed so that having said that let's continue so this is a natural energy and it is utterly simple all right i'm in the third line of the text here the natural energy is utterly simple. Of course it is. It's not complicated. It's not divided like we are. It's not treptos, uh, the Greek term for changing. Like, all right. So, and yet, and yet, it, mysteriously, he enters into this reality of change, and yet he is changeless. So, but it's always both end. Always both end. This natural energy is utterly simple, even as God's essence is utterly simple. All right, so let's not be confused. That is true about the energy uh, uh, as well as um, uh, God's essence. Nevertheless, and this is where the rationalist or the, the, the super logical uh, cannot operate very easily. Nevertheless, one finds in the works of the Holy Father, such as St. Gregory the Theologian, St. John of Damascus, St. Gregory Palamas, they're all over one voice, that this simple energy, merizete, Ameristos and meristis, okay, that's the Greek, is indivisibly divided among individual creatures. Let me read that again. Merizete is divided, ameristos, without division. It's divided without division. We actually say this about the very body and blood, uh, the body of our Lord at, after the consecration, the priest says something very similar. Divided and distributed is the Lamb of God, divided yet not 
oh, how does the English go? Uh, well, there's two very, there's two translations: broken and not divided. Uh, so that 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 paradox and that uh, that both and reality: broken but not divided, divided but not uh, disunited. That's how it is: divided but not disunited. Let me read it again, from memory. Uh, the body of God is both divided, and distributed, divided but not dis disunited, uh, and sanctifies those who partake of Him. All right. So this is the phrase that the priest says after the consecration. So it's very much throughout our theology and our experience, this, this paradox, uh, it is divided, mirizite, indivisibly. It is indivisibly divided, en miristis. In other words, in many instances or so, or, or many creatures, in individual creatures. This phrase is extremely important and frees us from the either or logical rationalistic approach to theology that is common in the West, unfortunately. So this means that it is one and yet has many consequences, many resultant energies. And this energy of God is present throughout creation. This one energy exists in each thing as one energy. And within each of these energies, all of God is present. This is just a, a mystery, but it's been received and experienced. And so it's confessed. All right? That's how we know this. You might say, well, where do they get this? Because they've lived it. They are expressing what they've lived. This is how they know God. This is, this is what we know. No one can make this stuff up. <laughs> so, so it is from experience, right? This is beyond logic. It's not some rational philosopher who sits down. That's exactly the problem is that Christians who run to the philosophers and allow them to be the criteria for analysis of the scriptures are already fallen away from the Christian experience. They're already distant from the Christian experience. That's it's not even at that point anything they produce is going to be problematic, because if you have a criteria, anything else but the experience of the Spirit of God, you will not not only not understand, but you will not express that. You, it has to be theology has to be experiential. Otherwise, it's the theology of demons. Theology of demons. Listen to what he said again. This one energy exists in each thing as one energy. Not 15 energies, one energy, and yet it exists in each individual creature. And within each of these energies, all of God is present. That's why when we go to Holy Communion, we don't say a portion of the body and blood of Christ, the servant of God partakes of the portion. No, no, no. It's the body and blood of Christ, period. All of God is present in every last, if you want to say molecule, every last part of the divine Eucharist, God is present in all of his energies, not just the divine Eucharist. All of God is present. Again, you're going to say, well, that doesn't make sense. How can you understand that? That doesn't seem logically possible. And precisely, it's not logically possible. It's beyond logic. It's beyond rational. It's That's the experience of God. And if it's not like that, it's probably not God. We're not experiencing God. In spite of this energy being simple, differences can be perceived between God's creative or providential energies and his purifying, illuminating, and deifying energies. So we have experience. The saints have experience. Not we. We, the saints, have experience. And they say, look, yeah, there's, all, there's these different operations, energies, actions of the Holy Spirit. They're not all the same. They're all the same spirit, and they're all the same God, and yet they have different resultant consequences they have different resultant energies, actions, right? So there's providential, there's creative, there's purifying, there's illuminating, there's deifying energies. Of course, all these have their presuppositions. All these have, they're setting their context. These distinct forms of the one self-same energy of God are not identical. The forms are not identical. If they were identical, then all creation would partake, for example, of God's glorifying energy. Right? If they were identical, if there's only one spirit, this is super important. People fall away from the orthodox boundaries of the church and become heretics without them knowing them, without knowing it, when they don't get this point right here. If the spirit was simple and identical in every action, then everyone would be participating in its purifying, illuminating, and deifying actions. But that doesn't happen. We know that from experience. Not everyone is deified. Not, not everyone is glorified, right? And there are presuppositions to this action. Free will, good disposition, submission to church, humility, baptism, chrismation. These things are presuppositions for the energies to work 
that purify, illumine, and deify, right? So those who teach, oh, well, there's between the Orthodox Church and the Heterodox Churches, Eucharist, baptism, it's all, we see them forms, we see the things, they've been maintained, their teachings are more or less the same. Da, da, da. They have different categories and criteria they use, and they try to make this, well, this, we can see the, the spirit of God is there among, you know, this person or that action or this person who died for Christ. Therefore, that means the church is there. Therefore, that means the mysteries are there. Therefore, that means, no, that doesn't follow. That doesn't follow. Because the actions we know from experience in the church fathers, the actions of purification, elimination, deification have presuppositions. And yes, of course, the Holy Spirit is without throughout creation. Yes, of course, it's in providentially caring and moving among all peoples and all of all. There could the world would cease to exist. People would cease to exist. There would be no knowledge of anything without the Spirit of God dwelling and working throughout all of humanity. And yet, that providential creative energy is not the energy that is going on in the process of purification, elimination, deification. Let's read on because we're getting a little bit off our main topic. We know from the church's experience of the grace of God that there is a difference between the illuminating grace of God and the deifying grace of God. We know this because not of all have reached theosis. This is Father John Romanides uh, says this particular path, uh, thought. The distinction of energies is also apparent in the church's preeminent prayer to the Holy Spirit in which we call on him. So this reminds us now of what we just said about the day of Pentecost and about the teachings from Revelation. It brings us back a little bit to our topic. Who is everywhere present and fill us all things, we say. Right? We just got done saying how that's possible. He is just is. He's in all things. There is no movement in God because he's everywhere present and fills all things. And, and yet we say to him, come and abide in us and cleanse us. Well, there's movement, isn't there? And there's, a, there's an abiding that's not going on, even though he's present in all things. So at, at one and the same time, Christ, the Holy Spirit is present in all things, including us. And yet he... He's not present in the same way, isn't he? Because we're saying, come and abide in us and be present in us as purifying, as illuminating, as, as deifying energies. Isn't that amazing? Don't you all stand in awe right now of the, of the, of the, uh, what, the one and the same time that you and I have the Spirit of God, and yet not every one of us have it in the same way, and not every one of us have it as a purifying, illuminating, and deifying fire. Well, there you go. There's there's the teaching, essentially, in a nutshell, of what the difference between heaven and hell. We're all going to be in the presence of God, and yet it's not going to be the same experience, just like it is not the same experience. Because this, the presuppositions, our side of things, are different. Every one of us has a different, we're taking a different set of things to, to this union. Right? We're coming at it in a different way, in a different intensity, in a different with different presuppositions, different uh, dispositions, different love, how much love each one of us has. There's a variety of things. How we approach this union with God and how what we've done to be in union with God, right? So this prayer would make no sense if it was a simple uh, and indistinct operation of the Holy Spirit throughout all creation. We would not pray this prayer. It would be a, it would be a foolish. So this prayer is only in the Orthodox Church makes sense and is lived and is expressed because of the Orthodox experience of the grace of God. If I go on, he was already present in creation in the same way that he makes his abode in us to cleanse, illumine, and deify us, there would be no reason to call upon him. We just said that to come and dwell in us. Hence, there is a great difference between his creative and providential energies, which pervade all creation, and his illuminating and deifying energies which only dwell in those who have been purified and illumined in baptism and prismation and persevere in the unity of the body, exchanging the kiss of peace and communion of the immaculate body and blood of Christ. And I just named a few of the presuppositions for that perseverance, preservation, and, uh, and, and, and advancement in the communion with God. The distinctions, as Father John Romanini says, and with that we'll stop, we'll go on to our next topic. The distinctions between the spiritual stages are the grounds for including among the divine energies, the energies of theosis, illumination, and purification, which is the energy associated with those being instructed in the faith, the purification, right? Interesting here. Many people think purification begins after baptism. No, wrong. Purification does not begin after baptism. It is a totally different experience of purification after baptism. Actually, baptism is the 
part is the beginning of illumination. We saw the ones who are newly illumined are the ones who are newly baptized, right? But purification has to go on before we reach the baptismal font. That's what the catechumen is all about. Unfortunately, most people, and I've said this many times, I'll say it many times more, don't understand what the catechumen is really for. They think it is just to learn about the church as opposed to enter into the life of the church and to be purified so that they can be illumined and be transformed and be transfigured when they reach the baptismal fount. And unfortunately, of course, many people are not even baptized today because we've fallen into a deluded and misunderstanding of these, this topic in particular about the division and distinction of energies and the presuppositions for the energies of God. And we've become extremely legalistic and external in our analysis of the very mystery which brings people into the uh, church and which begins the path of illumination, uh, which is a, a great a mystery of iniquity in our day. It's a great tragedy that we as Orthodox Christians, many of us, are not understanding and entering into the patristic teaching on this so basic teaching. You have to be an Orthodox Christian in order to participate in these energies. Father John Romanides is talking. And every Orthodox Christian does not do so. See that? Every Orthodox Christian does not do so. It's not automatic. Oh, you're in the church. Now you're saved. We don't even have anything remotely like that teaching in the Orthodox Church. Once saved, always saved. No, 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 no. It's free. You are free, brothers and sisters, to walk away from Christ. You are free to make a mess of your relationship with Christ. And you are free to humble yourself and repent and come back and make progress. This is in your hands, my hands. So not every Orthodox Christian, certainly those who are outside of this experience, who do not even have the presuppositions, cannot experience this, the divine energies of purification, illumination, and deification, uh, the, that which happens in earnest uh, in the life of the church, including the catechumenate. Every Orthodox Christian does not do so, but only those who are properly prepared, spiritually speaking. Now, we could talk a lot about that, but that's not the topic tonight, so we're going to move on. Hopefully, uh, let me just move back couple slides and this this has been helpful to you to unpack what we've talked about here going back a bit in these triparion and in these teaching here on the uh uh oh i got a little there we go you remember this right undivided divided gifts etc the divine math the seven spirits uh and this teaching hopefully unpacks how those energies of the one spirit are, in, are in, at the same time doing many different things to different people in different uh, ways. Uh, so let's go on to Revelation 1.5, and we're looking at the text now. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince or the king of the uh, ruler of the kings of the earth. O Jesus, Isu Christu, o martis opistos, o prototokos ton necron, so we have three different epithets. Faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. All right, So this all refer to who? Jesus Christ. And in particular to his human nature. Not to his divine nature. To his human nature, these things are referring. Let's remember, Jesus Christ, human nature, this is referring to firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, as a hu his human nature, faithful witness, his human nature. He was faithful unto death, Jesus Christ. And, of course, he is divine human. We're not separating this. These are noetically separated. These are per pertaining to that aspect of his person. Jesus Christ refers to the human nature when it's, when it's used in the Scripture and Son of God to the divine nature as a rule, as a rule. Here, St. John wants to present to us Jesus Christ, who is the center of history. Remember what happened in the, just the last couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the feast uh, well, on, the old, on the church calendar just a couple of days ago, the feast of the presentation, the meeting of the Lord in the temple. And what does St. Simeon say? Uh, this is for the fall and rise. Uh, this is a sign to be spoken against. This person, this Jesus Christ, this God incarnate, is the center of history and people will rise and fall and the hearts will be revealed and the sign will be spoken is yes, everything going forward now will it will be determined on how you and i stand before jesus christ that he will be the one upon which 
all will be judged. His commandments, his person, his example, his teachings, his, his uh, body, his church. How did we react? How did we come? How did we stand before the mystery of the incarnation? That will determine how we are eternally, where we go eternally, what we will be in eternal life. Did we, in, did we rejoice and run to the truth of the revelation of Jesus Christ? Or did we walk away and eschew and say, no, 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 I, I know better. Okay, He is the center of history and the central figure of all the events that St. John is about to describe in the book of Revelation, in his vision, all right? So this is why these, these words are extremely important. Now let's unpack them a bit. Let's look at the faithful witness. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. First of all, we have this as a name of God himself in the Old Testament. Oh, here we go back to the Old Testament to see and verify and see again the authenticity of the book of Revelation and the interconnectedness to the whole history of salvation uh, in the Old and New Testament. And we see in Psalm 88 the phrase, and as the moon is to endure all through the age, so is the witness of heavenly in heaven faithful. So this faithfulness in heaven, this faith, witness from heaven, which is faithful, this is Yahweh, this is Jehovah, this is the Lord. He is the faithful witness in Psalm 88 or 89, if you're using the uh, non-Orthodox Psalter. Uh, in the Septuagint, it's 88. Jesus Christ. And again, he gave witness to the truth. In John, we hear the same phrase. To this end I was born, and for this cause I came I into the world, that I should bear witness, faithful witness. Martis opistos, to, unto the truth. And again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He himself is the truth. He bears witness to himself that he is the truth. And he is faithful until death. He is the faithful witness. And Elder Athanasius says, uh, Elder Athanasius says here, outside of Christ, there is deep darkness. This is a wonderful quote. Listen carefully. Listen carefully, everybody. Stop what you're doing and listen to the great elder here. Inspire us. And I hope, hope, I'm hoping that everybody is having no problems with the, the technology. Hopefully I'm not I don't have any issues here. But listen to what he has to say. Outside of Christ, there is deep darkness. Philosophers are struggling. They not only contradict each other, but they often contradict themselves. <laughs> they go around in circles full of uncertainty. My friends, if we do not know Christ, we are living in deep darkness. We should feel very privileged. We should feel ecstatic because we know how to get to know Christ. Or at least we know the way to get to know Christ in his fullness. So he is a faithful witness for everything he will say. This applies whether written or unwritten, of course. Everything that is written in the book of Revelation is trustworthy and true. He is a faithful witness. We have access we should be ecstatic. How much? How many of us are ecstatic, full of joy every day at the thought that we have access, we know Christ in all of this insanity and this confusion and this darkness in our world. We know Christ. We have access to the salvation in which he imparts. We should be ecstatic, he says. I love that. That is so important today in the midst of all this darkness in the world today. He is a faithful witness. Listen to this now. The term martis in Greek, witness, right? We see in the 115, the word of God is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. It's worthy. Uh, it's a faithful witness. The words in Revelation 3.14, we see the words of the amen and the faithful and true witness, all, all describing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Elder says something very interesting. He says, it's not an accident that in the Greek language, of course, this was written in the Greek language. The word witness and the word martyr are the same. The word witness and the word martyr are the same. Same word. We have two different ones in, in English. We're taking actually, strangely, we're taking the word that's in Greek for witness, and we've now made it into martyr, which means somebody who is a witness um, and unto death, usually. In any case... So Christ is also a true witness, a true 
true martyr because he martyred he was martyred or allowed himself to be martyred on the cross he was raised upon the cross for the sake of the true witness or martyria since the martyria or witness of the truth is indispensably connected to sufferings and the fierce attacks of the devil the devil held world attacking those who witness the truth the word martyrion in greek means both witness and suffering so we have another term that has a double meaning martyrion means witness and suffering the the i the implication here is that if we are true faithful witnesses to christ we will suffer we will be on the cross we will be a martyr if you're not being martyred you're not on the cross you're not raised up then you're not a witness to christ in this world think about that today in our age of secularism when we want to have both and but in this case it's not a good both and it's the world and christ we want to have two masters we are deluded we are totally deluded into thinking we can do that right we think we can do that but we're deluded we're in total spiritual prelests. It's either the cross, suffering, martyrdom, and true witness, and redemption, and freedom in Christ, or it's the opposite. You can't have both. You can't be in both at the same time. You're not a faithful witness if you're trying to do both. How many of us are, in one way or another, there's a variety of ways we can do that, we're essentially avoiding the cross. Could be from small things, could be major things. Could be major things. It could be, you know, suffering physical harm. It could be losing our job. It could be uh, being totally slandered and, and held up as a, as a, I don't know, as a fake or as a liar. I mean, there's a variety of ways the world, the devil-held world, as he says here, attacks those who are faithful witnesses. And it doesn't matter actually how that goes about but it will go about it will happen for the faithful witnesses those who are like christ and of course after the christ he ascended the cross we are his disciples we must ascend the cross as well all right first born from the dead this is the second phrase the first begotten or first born of the dead we see in 1 Corinthians 15 20, the same witness here as in the book of Revelation. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And St. Paul says again in Colossians 1 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So he witnesses again to the same phrase. Christ is called the firstborn from the dead, being the first one to burst out from the belly of Hades. So he burst out. It was this action, this, this forceful, violent undoing of, the, of, of the, the dead end of Hades, which was, of course, not communion with God, right? So we were cut off from communion uh, with God, and he brought an end to that. He opened up the path again. For us to be eternally with God. He is the first in everything. And he paves the way for all of us who follow. This is the identity of Jesus Christ. This is the one who's revealing. Uh, in the book of Revelation. Everything to the uh, angel. to the And to the apostle. And, and the, uh, to the church. The identity of the one witnessing to John. Is fully certified here. And it is none other than Jesus Christ. Now, it may not be very clear here, but towards the end of the chapter, Christ will say, I became dead, and behold, I am alive again. Alive again through his holy resurrection. It refers to the human nature, and we're specifically, uh, and, and specifically to the body, because the soul does not die. All right? So this phrase, firstborn from the dead, ref refers to the human nature and to the body. In other words, the holy resurrection. Do you know that every single human being, no matter what stance they took with respect to the Jesus Christ, will rise from the grave? All will rise. No one will be left in the grave. 
there is a resurrection unto life, and there's a resurrection of the judgment, right? The resurrection of the life of those who lived for Christ and died the first death here, in other words, to the old man of the passions, and then therefore, when the second death comes, they are not going to die eternally, but live. And th those who refuse to die to the old man, refused or, or neglected or were indifferent to the question at all, and then when their second death, the bodily death, the separation of soul, the body comes, they will have a resurrection, but it will not be unto life. So there is a resurrection for all. The body will rise. The human nature has risen already. He is the first fruit of everyone's resurrection. No one will remain. And yet what kind of resurrection, what kind of eternal life will we have? So the firstborn from the dead is the pre-eternal God who became Came man, died on the cross, resurrected, and now lives as God man forever and ever. He is the pre eternal God. He died on the cross, resurrected, and now lives. Now, let's listen to St. Athanasius, the greatest whole mystery of the firstborn or, or, or first begotten of the dead. And in the next place, he says, This is against the discourse, second discourse against the Arians, 21 8, paragraph 61. And in the next place, when he put on the created nature and became like us in body, reasonably was he therefore called both the brother and firstborn. For though it was after us that he was made man for us, and our brother by similitude of body, still he is therefore called and is the firstborn of us. Because all men being lost according to the transgression of Adam, his flesh before all others was saved and liberated as being the word's body. And henceforth, we, becoming incorporate with it, the body, the word's body, right, are saved after its pattern. For in it, the Lord becomes our guide to the kingdom of heaven and to his own father, saying, I am the way, I am the door. And through me, all must enter. Whence also he is said to be first born from the dead, first begotten. Not that he died for before us, for we had already died first, but because having undergone death for us and abolished it, he was the first to rise as man for our sakes, rising, raising his own body. For our sakes, raising his own body. Henceforth, he having risen, we too from him, and because of him, rise in due course from the dead. All right, so here is a very good and thorough patristic uh, uh, un understanding and, and an explanation for why he's referred to as the firstborn, the first begotten of the dead. And here, again, the Book of Revelation is entirely and 100% in the patristic tradition and revealing the nature of the Lord. Ruler, uh, there's a third now, the third of the, th of the three that we're examining in Revelation 1.5, and that is he is O Archon Don Basileon Disgis, the prince or ruler of the kings of the earth, as pertaining to his human nature. He is truly a king. He is the ruler of history, and he is the universal judge. Listen to what John says in his gospel. Jesus answered, my kingdom, or I said the Lord should say, and it is recorded in the gospel. My kingdom is not of this world, he says before Pilate. Right? He witnesses to the kind of ruler he is. Is he like all the other rulers? No. Something different here, isn't there? He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the king of kings. But what kind of kingdom does he rule? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then we would then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered. He didn't say he wasn't a king. What did he say? Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. Is the deny his kingship. He says, yes, I'm a king. To this end I was born. And for this cause I came into the world. What is that? That I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So his kingdom is the kingdom of the truth. He's the ruler of over all the earth because he is truth incarnate. right? And everyone that hears the truth, the love, the truths. This is exactly what St. Paul says is the criterion of salvation in the end times. Those who love the truth will be saved in the end times. Those who do not will be lost. That means first and foremost the truth. Everything else is below it. Not I love the truth and 
I love this world, not I love the truth, and I love my position, I love my fame, I love my fortune, I love my, no, 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 only the truth first and foremost, No, nothing else on that level, everything else below it, everything is sacrificed for the sake of the truth. And he is the victor over all, listen to Revelation 17, 14, these shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, he is the king of kings, he is the lord of lords, this is the lord, Jesus Christ, the human nature of Jesus Christ, human nature, is the king of kings. He is the ruler of history in his human nature. And then we sing, and there's many, many references in the Psalms, the Lord is king and he is robed in majesty. The Lord is king forever and ever from the Psalms. So this is our Lord. And let us he has a journey he takes through history. The Logos, the God, the Word is present throughout history. He's coming. He's ever coming. He's ever present. He comes. Comes, he gives the martyria or the testimony. He suffers a martyr's death and he exits history. In reality, however, he takes human history along with him. Where does he go? Through his resurrection and ascension. He takes history along with him. He transformed history into his kingdom. Within history, his kingdom has been established. Where is it? It's in the within, isn't it? Where? And the kingdom of God is within you, he says. He rules through each heart, and he rules through his body, and he rules in his church. And it's a foretaste of the eternal kingdom. He assumes all of history, all creation, and chains it to the kingdom of God. He takes all of creation, and in the Eucharist, he offers it up and transforms it and gives it back to us as eternal life, as the kingdom of heaven. All of creation is offered up in the Eucharist. All men, taisa ek tonson. Thy own of thine own we offer unto thee, according to all, not on behalf, that's a bad translation, according to all and for all. Kata panda, kata panda, according to all and for all, dia panda. So this is the kingdom, and he has established it, and it reigns, and it's real, and you enter into it, and you live it, and he rules, and he reigns in the heart of every Christian, not just in the divine liturgy, but in the heart, every day, all day, through the prayer, that's how he reigns and rules over the passions and over the devils and over the fallenness of this world. He reigns in his saints and all those who seek to be, first and foremost, disciples of the truth and to die for that truth. And I'm going to quote to you a very good, beautiful quote from the elder. True theology, the bread that nourishes the children of God, along with the Eucharist, of course, inseparable from it, is the truth. That truth that we worship and we live in. So he says to his, his listeners, a plea at the end of, the, of his lecture. He says, we must lift up our minds. We must lift up our minds. We must elevate spiritually, raise our spirituality. Our spiritual standards need to get higher. He's speaking in the 1980s to the Greek people. And how much more? Hmm. If he was alive today, what would he say to us? What would he say to us? Oh, Lord. We must elevate. Let's not limit ourselves to some basic morality. No. Christ did not incarnate to make us nice people, good people, moral people. Most Christianity today, let's face it, brothers and sisters, it's just a bunch of moral uh, uh, platitudes. Be a good person. Far, far from the revelation, far from what the saints achieved, far from what God calls us. Such a low level, such a worthless, uh, well, not worthless entirely, but so tragic, so tragic. The level that we've fallen as people who call on Christ, and he gave us so much more. Be good people. That's what You're a good person. He's such a good person. Oh, that's great. It's good, but it's not holy. Uh, goodness, holiness, one presupposes the other. One is not the other. If you don't have holiness, goodness is not going to get you anywhere. Christ did incarnate to make nice people. <laughs> Let us stop telling ourselves that we are good people and that this is sufficient, resting in the self sufficiency. This is a sickness, actually. Self sufficiency. It's actually a sickness. It's like spiritual sickness. I'm a good person. I, people say this all the time. They're so sad. It's so sad to hear it. I was with somebody a couple of days ago. You know, I'm really, I'm a, he actually said, I'm a good person. I think I'm one of the best people I know. 
I said, Lord, have mercy, poor man. He really was. He's a very good man. I'm sure he's. You know, he's trying to be a good man. I think he wants to be, but there's been no initiation into the mystery of the incarnation and then cross. Nothing. He's a, he's outside of that experience. We rest in our self sufficiency, he says, which is nothing more than a spiritual starvation limit. I'm not sure about the Greek here. I wish I, could, I didn't have the Greek in front of me, but you know, we cause the the cause. We are the cause of the starvation, right? The spiritual uh, star starvation, starvation that we allow ourselves. Right? We cut ourselves off from the banquet of the spiritual life. When we are content with a few crumbs of some religious knowledge, right? We amass horizontal knowledge is what I like to call it. We get to know about the church, about history, about the spiritual life. We learn that we give them experts, right? We give lectures. Here we go, right? I, this is the kind of thing that can damn you. You know, you can think that this is this, this is what it's all about, being here and talking to you all day and telling you everything that I that I'm I don't know any. Do I know anything? I'm telling you what the fathers say. It is super dangerous to do this and think that this is what's going to save you. I've got all kinds of religious knowledge. I go to Father Peter's classes. I get all kinds of knowledge. And then I feel really good about myself as a Christian. Folks, this is just the beginning. This is just a little. I'm trying to help you along the way. There's a lot more that we're not talking about. A lot more we need to do. So much more that we need to do to, be, to enter into the spiritual life. This is not what it's about. This is a presupposition in many ways, right? We come here to learn and to go into it, but it's not the same thing as a spiritual life. He says, no, my friends, the children of God must be filled with the bread of God, and the bread of God is the bread that came down from heaven. God, the word who gave himself for food, real food. So on the one hand, he's saying truth is this is the, what nourishes true theology, and yet that leads and is inseparable from the real food, which is the Eucharist, which is communion with, with Christ himself. It's not about being a good person. It's not about acquiring knowledge. It's about entering into communion. It's about being transfigured and transformed. All right, that's enough for tonight. I think we've given you plen plenty to chew on and hopefully have helped you hone your mind to so see the spiritual life in a better Christ is calling us to. Sorry for the interruptions. Sorry for the bad connection. I'm not sure how to fix Fix that. I wish I could do more. We need to maybe upgrade our internet. I think maybe that's the issue. I don't know. Um, but let's always end here and remind ourselves this is the end. We're going to reach this quote eventually, but this is where we're headed. Remember that we arrive eventually at the point where we have tremendous longing for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If we can arrive to the point where we want more than anything else for the Lord to come and return and for us to be with him and depart this vain world and to be with him, I think then we have really uh, used our time wisely. This is this is what we've, we've come to this world for. So lesson four is over. Let's open it up to questions. And hopefully the interruptions, hopefully the interruptions were not severe and that the basic teaching was communicated. Um, I feel terrible about that many times. So let's see what questions we have. Now, I did, uh, John, I did go through, and uh, um, I don't know if you saw that, but there's a way for you to star. Uh, I did star three questions. I have those starred uh, in our, uh, our StreamYard uh, interface here. If you can see those live, and then over here is starred. If you have any other questions that you want to submit and you don't, uh, you know, if people want to submit, they can still submit right now questions. If, if I can answer them, I'll definitely try. Uh, let's start with um, some of these questions that we have. We have three questions right now, it looks like. Um, Brennan D. Do any of the Holy Fathers teach post-millennialism? The church will usher in a thousand years of global secular peace after which the Lord will unleash Satan and return to defeat him. Uh, we are getting ahead of ourselves there, Brennan. We're going to get to that, obviously, in this course. It's going to be a while, though, but I'm, I'll give you a two-word answer. Actually, one-word answer, no. No church fathers ever taught that. In fact, that's uh, uh, basically the heresy of Chiliasm, which was condemned by the church. Uh, there were a few who flirted with it, but no, the church never embraced that. It rejected that, and it's uh, been condemned in council. 
that is a misunderstanding of the book of Revelation. Uh, it's an understanding of the second coming. Uh, the Lord will not come and reign on this earth uh, and uh, be a, a world ruler. Uh, that's partly what is being taught by the Chilias, the Chilias. Uh, but we will come back to that in due time. Excuse me. And we will examine it. If you want some quick answers, in uh, there's a chapter dedicated to this question uh, of Chileasm. I'm think I'm assuming this, this is what you're trying to describe here. Um, I mean, global global secular peace. Uh, no, that's not going to happen until the Lord makes all things new after the second coming. There's a new heaven and new earth. Um, so the thousand years is the first of the second coming. That's how the fathers interpret the thousand years. But I don't want to get ahead of that. I don't like. Um, I don't like addressing things piecemeal. I want to put it in the context and build up to it. So stick with us. It may be a while, but we will get to it. And you'll have a thorough answer, uh, not just a piecemeal answer. Uh, if an icon bleeds, what does this mean? Well, that's a good question. I don't think we have official teachings on what it means. I can tell you that um, the even the myrrh from an icon, the, the, the weeping, so-called weeping icons, could be interpreted differently. Uh, and may mean different things. Certainly, it is like should be interpreted as the immense love and compassion of our Lord and the Mother of God for us and the people in this world. Uh, a call to repentance. Every single uh, manifestation of grace in these mysterious uh, things that happen to icons and crosses and all this that we see going on is certainly, first and foremost, should be interpreted as a call to repentance. Uh, and, of course, if there was true repentance, there would be tr true communion and there would no be there would be no. Um, there'd be a lot less reason for the mother of God and the Lord and himself to intervene into history with these miraculous occurrences. Right. Because people would already be with, in communion with the Lord. But these things come precisely to bring us to our senses, usually, and to call us to repentance. And I, I would say that that's how you should interpret everything and not in any kind of triumphalistic way that would be a mistake Teresa mason your question is you may have answered this on crowdcast but is the book of revelation describing what christ saw at his baptism when he saw the heavens open no i've never heard that interpretation personally i don't know where you get that is that some kind of i mean is that a that would be news to me if this was a church father talking or any saint that, that i know uh and i've read and never seen that um no, that, that does not follow. And I, is there some kind of witness to that? I mean, how would they even know that? Did Christ, are they supposing that Christ um, came and told people that this is what I saw at my when the heavens were open? This mystery? It's Christ himself who's speaking. Uh, so he's revealing it to, to the angel, to, 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 uh, to John. Um, so I don't know. It's a little strange. I've never heard this, no. Happy to be corrected to some church fathers, said it, but I doubt it. Stan's channel is, uh, I guess, the name of this person's handle there. Hello, sorry for the unrelated question. I'm interested in becoming Orthodox. Was wondering on average, how long does it take to complete the catechism course? Well, um, Stan, I think that's if I'm talking to Stan right now. I'll give you a general answer and then a specific answer, uh, not for you personally, because I don't know you, but uh, in our day and age, there is the historic time period of the ancient church, which is three years. And that's not an accident because it's based on the three years that the apostles spent with our Lord before the days of Pentecost. And so in the same way, the church fathers generally would require three years of initiation. And those three years were spent not just learning about and not and very little was about learning about the church, but it was mainly a process of purification from the old ways. So the pagans would have to give up their old ways and distance themselves from all of the pagan practices and the pagan ideas and the fornication and the idolatry and the, all the rest that went on for that normal, quote unquote, normal pagan way of life. And that was a process. And of course, they didn't just do it for a day or two, but they had to show themselves as stable in that denial of the old man and the old ways. And that's why they took plenty of time. Has this person remained 
faithful and far from the allurement of this world for three years. That was uh, a part of what the whole process was. And there was much more to do that. There was, there was, there was of course, much teaching. There was, uh, there was uh, exorcisms going on, not just the last couple of days or not just on the mystery, but before that. Uh, and so uh, three years would be an ideal time. And I think we're in a, we're in a post-Christian, increasingly idolatrous world. So there's plenty of reason to believe that people uh, have along their path, many of them on their way to Christ, uh, they've fallen into pagan practices, uh, fornication. They've fallen into perhaps even uh, dabbling in a cult or dabbling in a new age. And all of this stuff is not that far uh, from what the church was facing in the early church and in the fourth century when St. Cyril was teaching his people in Jerusalem and gives us his, his wonderful catechism. Now, having said that, the reality is in a lot of places, you will not get anything like that. And that's the tragedy that we do not have that uh, that as a standard, we don't have, unfortunately, that being imposed or even expected or even calling upon many to keep that standard. Far from it, I would say that you, many priests, many people would be um, well served today if they got one year uh, of intense catechism. Uh, my personal experience, even though the man was a good man, I don't just don't think people know, and I didn't know, of course, as a catechumen myself. Uh, but I got basically a few books to read, and then I was ready to be baptized. And that was a tragedy for me and for him and for all of us, because that's not a catechism. So I would say at least a year, and if more. But of course, it's not just the time, it's what's going on during that time. And again, the main task of the catechumen is to go through a process of purification from the old man, the old ways, the ways of th thinking the ways of living and beginning in earnest the prayer life the jesus prayer fasting getting to a point where you have a you've arrived at a regiment and a way of life which is christian thoroughly christian so that when you are baptized there is no obstacle for the full engagement and enjoyment in the best sense of the word of the grace of god and the tra transformation that comes with the presence of god in us next question I'm doing a Bible word study on Diek, Diek Volas. Diek Volas. Uh -huh. But it's strangely hard to find info about this word. Uh, frankly, I don't even know what word you're referring to. I'm assuming it's Greek, but it's in, translated Diek Volas. Uh, I know it's related to Ekvalo, yeah. Casting and sending out. Uh, Father, Father, here's his thoughts. I know it's not related to the talk, so only if it doesn't have any other questions. Yeah, yeah, I would have to look it up myself. I'm sorry, I can't help you. I don't, uh, I don't know the uh, particular phrase off the top of my head. I'd have to examine it myself, but nothing comes to mind. Um, yes, ekvalo is to be to to send out or cast off, uh, but diekvalo, diekvalos. I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I'll see if I can look it up, and maybe next time we get together, we'll have uh, that ready, and you can ask me. We'll see. Write me maybe offline. We'll see what I can do. Does one grow, question, does one grow in relationship, knowledge of God in heaven? Have you seen the miracle of white dove landing on an icon of Christ's baptism in Ukraine in January? Uh, the first question is that the relationship and knowledge of God, because God is e e eternal and infinite, is therefore eternal and infinite as well. Uh, so we go from glory to glory. There is a never-ending increase in love and the communion with God for those who love him. Secondly, uh, I did see a, um, I think you're referring to a video where there was a priest, um, I think he was during Theophany, if I'm not, correct, not mistaken. I thought it was in Australia, actually, but I guess you're saying it was in, it was in Russia. Is that correct? Ukraine. And I saw the dove go and fly up to the icon of Christ. Yes, I did see that. That's not that surprising, frankly. There's so many miracles going on around the world right now with weeping icons, and we just had the we just had the weeping icon of Hawaii with us, and it was gushing. Myrrh, uh, uh, as always, and so you know these are these are the miracles of God's presence in the world that that the, the church lives through and has lived with uh, for two millennia. Thank God, Father. How should we respond to those who criticize the truth, Catholicity, of Orthodoxy? 
citing current events in Europe. Uh, he's talking about Russia and the Ukraine. Okay. Well, this, there's actually plenty of things today that I, I would say that uh, the, the sadness that we all have over the schism, the schismatics who've been um, uncanonically and uh, in an unorthodox manner have been recognized by the ecumenical patriarchate now we have a full-blown schism with the church of russia and between the patriarchate of russia and, and the patriarchate of constantinople and now alexandria i mean this is a tragedy uh it's a tragedy because but it's it's understandable I mean, if you have if anyone has spent time and examined the situation it's not a mystery why we're at this point of of, of sadness um so i would say that if to the people who are most likely criticizing things in a superficial and kind of, uh, you know, uh, bitter manner, not with sympathy or not with compassion, not with care, but as a way of a polemic. Uh, I don't know if I'd spend much time with people who are polemical and, and don't have any kind of Christian charity or Christian um, mindfulness about, uh, about things. And they're just kind of superficially looking for some kind of criticism. But if somebody was sincere and said, you know, I'm really troubled by this, and how do you explain this? I would say, first and foremost, uh, that this is not unique. There's been schisms upon schisms. The Pope and Catholicism and the papal Protestants have uh, are, are the ones in historically the, uh, in Rome that have caused the greatest, the most uh, disastrous schism, bringing uh, taking with them out, outside the church, and, you know, billions of people throughout the ages. So uh, this is a tragedy of the fallen world that there are people uh, who were once in the church but have have increasingly uh, become alienated from the church. And so this is this is why schisms happen because people individually and then collectively have departed from the narrow path in the spiritual life. It's not it's not a uh, witness to the church; it's a witness. To to the falling away from the church. So, so, so first of all, it's a tragedy, but it's understandable. One can explain the tragedy. And I think that the, in, in short, the heart of this tragedy is a departure from Orthodox ecclesiology. It didn't start yesterday. It really doesn't have all that much to do with the particulars in, in Ukraine at all. It has to do with decades and decades of a departure, a slow and painful departure from Orthodox ecclesiology. Insofar as a papalistic mentality has crept in among hierarchs and the, in particular, the uh, uh, Patriarchate of Constantinople, you have, I mean, it's, it's actually a sickness throughout the Orthodox Church today. I would say almost every local church has uh, aspects of this sickness. You have a papal kind of ecclesiology that's on the rise. And of course, that's going to bring division upon division because it's not a, it's not the uh, synodical, sobernos, the, the Russians would say, the the conciliar, uh, mutual humility, mutual obedience in Christ that the church ha has and has experienced uh, uh, from the apostles onward. It's a departure from the life of Christ uh, in the church. And it's the rise of, a, of, a, of an ambition and a worldliness and an arrogance and the, all these passions that animate. And then we find uh, theological and canonical justifications for our ambitions. And we, and we go with the worldly and the powerful of the world and we we, we, we do, uh, uh, we make um, uh, agreements and all the rest. Uh, and we work with those people who serve the enemy of our salvation many times among the powerful of the world. I mean, the, it, it's, it's understandable if, you under, if you've been paying attention or you've been researching and studying church history for the last hundred years, it's not a surprise that we've arrived at this kind of division. You could almost count on it. And it Uh, intention toward a false union with uh, the uh, papal Protestants. You see that very clear. Uh, they're they're re uh, as I said last week. We have a new delusional idea that there was never a great schism. That it was just a breaking communion. That there's no heresy in among the papal Protestants. I mean, which is taken up by several prominent apologists for the. Uh, for that ecclesiology we see behind the Ukrainian schism, uh, well, 
if 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 a large swath is uh, of the Orthodox are outside of the communion, uh, well, this might open the door for even for a quicker uh, march toward false union. So we might even see worse. I don't know. God only God knows. Uh, is not uh, the falling away and the dis and the distortion of the Orthodox ecclesiology and the and the and the not the cessation of following the saints is at all too orthodoxy or reflection of orthodoxy. So I would say orthodoxy, what's happening? No, this is a incursion of the worldly spirit. It, the saints are the ones that they present orthodoxy. Follow. And if you want to be orthodox, follow them. If you want to be orthodox, understand orthodoxy. That's who you run to. That's who you understand and again sit at the feet of. Everything else, whether it be immorality, whether it be worldliness, whether it be delusion or heresy, is the unfortunate reality of this fallen world. It's always been there from the beginning, and it and it and none of us followers of and was possible and worked toward toward the to, toward their um, uh, removal from amongst the Orthodox. Uh, we should be a part of that healthy uh, reaction uh, which is going to then hopefully by God's grace call down the mercy of God and end this uh, uh, this uh, departure from orthodoxy and only God only God can solve this and he will in due time through uh, uh, various interventions in history that's the only hope or we're going quickly to the second coming of our Lord I don't I don't see any element at this point which can turn the tide because the people involved in these schisms and in these uh, delusions, these new uh, found ideas with, uh, about heterodoxy and the boundaries of the church, they're not checkable in any human way. I mean, they're on their path and they're, they're, they're supported by the worldly powers and they're going to march to wherever they're going to, you know, march to. And so uh, the rest of us who don't want to follow them into uh, delusion, we have to work, fervently, uh, first of all, on our own salvation, secondly, to help our brothers and sisters who care and want to listen, and thirdly, uh, for the um, marginalization of such uh, ideas and, 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 and uh, uh, teachings um, in that order. That's what I would say. I don't know. There's a lot you could say. Hopefully that helps you. Next question. <clears throat> what are actual what are actual Dwellings in heaven? What is heaven in orthodoxy? I ask because when someone passes away, we usually say, Calo paradis, so good paradise, uh, not heaven. Thank you very much in advance. Okay, so paradise is heaven. Paradise is God. Paradise is Christ, right? To, to, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, being with Christ is paradise. You will be with me, uh, that's paradise. He is the kingdom of God because it says the kingdom of God is within you. What does that mean? His indwelling. I will come and take up a boat in you with my Father, right? He is the kingdom of heaven. Communion with God is heaven. It's that simple. It's not some place. It's not some creation of his. It's the uncreated grace of God. It's the uncreated energies of God. It's him. It's him, God himself, and our communion with him. Jay Thompson, what are Father Peter's thoughts on the movie Man of God? Well, I rarely watch movies. I don't have time for it, but I don't. I don't just do. I just don't do it much anymore. But I did watch that because somebody sent it to me, and I had some time. I think I was traveling. I think I was traveling back and forth to Greece. Back. I don't remember when I saw it. So I spent some time and I watched it. And of course, any movie, no matter how good it is, is never going to capture and present a saint. It's impossible. You know, I saw the same thing that was produced by about uh, St. Joseph the Hesychist. Um, you know, it's a nice try, nice try. and I think they, they, I really applaud them for wanting to present uh, the life of a saint. That's always a wonderful thing, and I think there's a lot of people who I hopefully benefited from both of those attempts, and, and there'll be more attempts, and it may be blessed, but let's never imagine that a saint can ever be presented in, uh, let not even in writing, let alone in in video, right? So it's, uh, it's a... Um, task and a venture that's filled with 
problems and 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 obstacles that are not going to be overcome easily. So I, I I would say you know everything that can you know let's be all things to all people anything that can build up the kingdom of God or lead people toward it everything that can help people uh, step by step wherever they are whatever level to come closer to Christ and the church is good. Uh, at the same time, let's not uh, get get too carried away to think that this is something that is um, it's a medium that's limited. And uh, insofar as it's uh, it was done, it was done, I think, pretty well. Um, you know, there were some really good points and good examples there uh, that people can follow. Um, but hopefully people will then take the book and read it. And then hopefully they'll get an icon and they'll start their chant the services and they'll celebrate his feast day and they'll try to imitate him. Now, if that is the fruit of watching the video, I would say that's it's wonderful. But if, if it's just, oh, that was a nice video, we move on and nothing really changes then I think the goal of the movie maker, I hope the goal of the movie maker was, was what I just said, and uh, and therefore it's not going to be accomplished. So let's hope that people really want to move to love the saints and imitate them. That would be a good fruit of such a movie. To state my previous question more clearly, I guess I didn't answer it. How does free will work in the eschaton? Can we mess it up again due to our own free will? Okay, I didn't see that earlier. Forgive me. I'm glad you restated it. Let's see. Let's see the question. Does free will work in the eschaton? Can we mess it up due to our free will? Um, as far as I know, in my reading and my understanding of things, repentance, change, is possible in this life. St. John Damascus says clearly there is no repentance in Hades. So after the body, soul leaves the body, the time for repentance has come to an end. And what we will live will be uh, coming closer to Christ will be the pure mercy of God and the love of the brethren and not our own free will works, let's say. Okay, it's not going to change anything. It's going to be, if we are changed in all, at all, it will be the mercy of God and the love of the brethren and the, the divine liturgy, uh, which we know by experience does help and bring consolation uh, to those who are uh, who have departed this life. Uh, and who um, need our our assistance to, to draw cl closer to Christ. Um, and it's a gift of God, and everything is a gift of God ultimately. But as far as uh, departing this world, and especially after, the, of course, the second coming, nothing is going to change in that direction. There's no longer repentance after the departure of the soul from the body, let alone after the general judgment. So I don't think uh, we can mess it up again, no. Uh, uh, not because, and it's a mystery, I'm not sure, not because we don't have free will anymore, but because we've, we will be in communion in such a way that it won't even occur to us, it won't even come to us as something that is on the on the plate as a, as a choice, right? It's not that free will will be taken away because free will is is so intertwined with our own person. It's, it's part of the image and likeness, right? Part of the image. So, um, it's not going to be, be done away with, God forbid. And yet, at the same time, um, the choices will be only God, basically. Uh, that's what I understand. But I, I don't think that I'm, I, you know, I'm some kind of authority uh, to the degree I can just give you a 100% answer. I would still want to myself uh, explore some patristic text and give you something more um, definitive. So take that with a grain of salt. Okay, let's take a few questions from uh, the um, crowd crest crowd who are waiting patiently. And we're at two hours and 12 minutes. We've got a little time left, so there's more questions. Uh, Craig asks a question. In Tobit 1215, I am Raphael. Uh, I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels who present the prayers of the saints and enter into the presence of the glory of the Lord. Why would the seven spirits not be these seven archangels, but is rather the Holy Spirit? Um, because of all the other witness that we presented in the other scriptures, uh, because that's how the patristic teachers have understood it, uh, because archangels are archangels and spirits are spirits. And uh, we have the witness from the Isaiah 
of the sevenfold nature of the uh, spirit of God. Um, let's see what else, what other answer can I give to you? Uh, um, we don't have a witness of uh, those holy angels being identified as spirits, as far as I know. So I guess that would be my answer. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. I don't know. I just never, I never saw any reference patristic that I can see in the scriptural commentaries that I've found that would justify that interpretation. Father bless for someone that knows very little Greek. Is there an old Testament translation that you would recommend the Septuagint uh, in translation? I found the Holy Apostle common translations of the New Testament to be favorite, but there is an Old Testament strictly in English of the same quality? Not that I know of, no. But there is the Septuagint translated into English. That was what I would go for. It exists. You can find newer versions. There's an older version. There's It's online. I just was uh, perusing. Uh, I can give you the actual link right here. The Old Testament. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's one from the Greek Archdiocese, actually. Septuagint uh, online. Septuagint.bible. You can go there and you can read that uh, as one possibility. Uh, right now I'm using the Orthodox Study Bible and have been considering the LES from Lexham Press and the Septuagint that Ex Fontibus Press publishes. I don't know that Septuagint. I'm assuming that, I mean, how many translations of Septuagint exist? Probably two, maybe three, but not more. Parallel text translation would not be helpful to me too much yet without a lot of help. So that's what I would suggest, uh, Seraphim. Check out the uh, Greek Arts Diocese uh, version. That's a publication, I think, from over 100 years ago. Brenton, if you look up the Brenton uh, Septuagint, that might be helpful. Um, the Third Millennium Bible, I think, uses modern English. I'm not, Thomas Spiro, let me know. I, it's been a while since I looked at it. Um, but uh, so probably so does the Septuagint. I don't remember. Uh, online, I don't have access to it right now. Check out those uh, those two options. I think third millennium. That was that was, when it came out. There were a lot of Orthodox who liked it, so I don't know. I don't know. I haven't I haven't had much need of it because I read the Greek, and then I go to the English and look at it, and, and sometimes I tweak it. But um, that's uh, one option. Septuagint uh, which is uh, I guess a service of the Greek Arts Diocese. What is the best book to read concerning the topic you mentioned going from a morally good life to actual holiness? How do we bridge the gap and go deeper? Very good, uh, Subdeacon Ataras. Very good question. Uh, I don't think there's one book that I can say, this is it. You got it. Um, but there are several very good books that I would recommend. Um, there is uh, one published... Um, I want to say by Holy Trinity Press, which was very good collection of writings from the, uh, uh, including the Optin Fathers and others, uh, and the title just, just escaped me, but it was it was kind of in this vein. Um, there is, um, well, I think you know if you if it's just a basic text, everybody should have read this already, if they're especially the converts. But I think a really really good text that actually uh, Athenite Fathers liked a lot that I met. And that is um, The Way of the Ascetics by Tito Callender. Now, that definitely is about turning your life into an ascetic struggle, which is the spiritual life and not just a uh, self-sufficient uh, moral, uh, you know, minimalism. Uh, so that kind of text, which takes you into the deep things of the spiritual life, and you're examining your motivations, you're examining and being, uh, you know, your thoughts uh, and you're praying and you're... Uh, forcing yourself into the, you know, the kingdom of God is taken by violence and the violence taken by force. That's the kind of um, uh, approach that changes things for everybody, right? It takes you away from this external moralism and puts you in perspective of uh, the inner man and the purification and the illumination that needs to go about uh, the watchfulness, the nipsies of the, of course, there's so many spiritual treasures that you can turn to. I love the Desert Fathers. If, you, if you've read the Spiritual Meadow, it's a wonderful text. The Yeron Dikon, the Saints of the Desert Fathers, of course, is central. Of course, you have the Ladder of Divine Ascent. You have the writings of St. Isaac the Syrian. Um, there are many. Um, the the uh, um, uh, 
ever get the nos i think it's a five volume publication from center for traditional orthodox studies in english the ever get the nos very very basic and wonderful um many uh art of prayer collection on prayer uh, but i don't know it is not one book that i would say well that's going to get you out of that mindset into deep holiness um the actual spiritual life is going to do that. You know, having a spiritual father who's going to guide you deeper and deeper into ascetic struggle, uh, a pure confession, uh, fasting uh, more and more, um, communing more often, uh, saying the Jesus prayer, not just uh, here and there, and not just throughout the day, but actually having a rule of, of, of the Jesus prayer. These are the things that change one's life from... Uh, doing the right thing to becoming someone else, right? It's not what we do, it's who we become. Not what we do, who we're becoming. And that becoming has to be an internal uh, and not just an external uh, transfiguration. Uh, so the movements of the flesh, the movements of the eyes, the movements of the heart, the innovations, the thoughts, you know, uh, the inner man, how he works, that's what makes person a spiritual man. Where it, when that's being transfigured and reformed and, and, that, and that inner man is constantly cognizant of the will of God, right? doing the katedokian thelimathio, the will of God, which is the express will of God, not his what he allows because of our weakness, but what he desires. To get to that point, you have to uh, be, be um, totally vigilant and prayerful over the inner man. And then you're going to be sensitive to the will of God and to his desires, uh, his His will for you. Um, so let's see. We've got one more. We can take one more, I think. Do we have any more new new questions? John, do we have any more questions over there? It doesn't look like it. Um, oh, well, of course, there's contemporary writers, which I didn't mention, which everybody should be reading, like St. Saint, Saint Joseph the Hesychist. <clears throat> Um, St. Silouan, you know, uh, Life of Elder Paisius, all these things are going to be a tremendous help to becoming a spiritual man and, and not just uh, a moral man. Another question, could you talk about the proper inner disposition one should have while reading the Psalms during prayer, especially lesser known Psalms? When first praying the Psalter, this is from uh, Austinian James Yakovos. when first praying the Psalter, many of the Psalms are foreign and it's hard to pray for them from the heart and some of the psalms contain verses like the prophetic ones we covered tonight that induce amazement but sometimes necessary to pause to understand is it good to pause and go back and reread a psalm uh well let me ask that let me answer that first uh Yaakov. of course it's okay to go back and pause and read a psalm of course secondly um the inner disposition is going to be one always of uh a pain of heart a brokenness a contrition of heart that's what we're we, we need to be in continually right that's what we're looking for uh, continually, and not just a uh, uh, reading uh, the uh, uh, the in a rote way, you know, external way, intellectual way, you know, but with the heart. So uh, the pain of heart is a sign that we're actually praying. When we have compunction, when we feel when we feel uh, ourselves as standing before God and, and naked and feeling our sinfulness and seeing our, our, our lack and our weakness. Uh, that's where we're going to begin to actually pray with, I think, um, some benefit. And of course, if you don't have that, you don't say, oh, okay, I give up, I go away. No, 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 no. You continue, you force yourself, and you continue praying. Even standing with a cold heart and praying is far, far better than not praying at all. And it's a prerequisite to end up praying one day with a broken heart. So let's not never let no one come away and say, oh, Father Peter said it's better not just to don't pray at all if you have a cold heart. No, no, no. God forbid. Cold hearts, how's it going to be warmed if you stop praying? So you force yourself in prayer, but you're you're seeking. That's why we read the 50th Psalm so often in the Orthodox Church, right? It's almost... It's in the supplication service. It's in the comp line. Uh, it's, uh, of course, in the Psalter. Uh, it's in morning prayers, evening prayers, because this psalm so well expresses the disposition and stance that Christians have uh, during prayer. Um, 
but certainly we can stop and go back. I think good. It's also important you have a good translation, a good poetic translation of the Psalms in English. There's different because there's many for the last 25 years. The Psalter from Transfiguration Monastery in Boston, and you know, they're not, nothing's perfect, but it's certainly one of the better ones, I think, if not the best. Okay, uh, another question from the the uh, Aus, the Austinian uh, Evlogite. Uh, could you operate, uh, elaborate on the translation of thine own of thine own on behalf of all and for all? I was a bit confused by this when you mentioned the translation was off during the lecture. Could you also talk about the meaning here, since I frequently use lose sight of it? Well, there's just a ma minor, I think, a minor error in most translations, and, and I know that there's some, it's open to some. Um, you know, interpretation, but I think the Greek is pretty obvious. Uh, so uh, the, thine own of thine own is fine, uh, but the on behalf of all seems to be a little off. Uh, it actually says katapanda, which does not mean on behalf of all. It cannot mean on behalf. Uh, it's according to all, uh, according to Elder Athanas Metinios, who says somewhere in his lectures, that means a, according to all that he has taught us. In other words, we are faithful in everything you've taught us, according to everything you've given us, according to the deposit of faith, according to the holy tradition, according to the revelation, everything that we're offering to you, according to all and then for all, for all is pretty much uh, is fine. So the on behalf of all, I don't, it's almost redundant, by the way, on behalf of all and for all. It's not in the Greek. That's not the sentiment there. It's, uh, it's so it, that's a little off. I mean, I don't think it's the end of the world, but I, I really would wish that that would be corrected because I don't think that uh, the Greek is uh, is best expressed by on behalf of all. Uh, all right. I'm not sure what that's all about. Uh, Joshua, have you ever visited the monastery on Patmos? Uh, this is from Joshua. Uh, thanks be to God, I did have an opportunity to visit uh, about 12 years ago now, I think, maybe 13. And I spent a few days on Patmos, met with the abbot, had a wonderful tour, uh, went to the monastery where Elder Amphilokios, now St. Amphilokios, lived of Patmos, uh, was able to go down to the monastery where St. Savas of Kalimnos lived. I went down to the, the next island, Kalimnos. It was a wonderful visit. Uh, thank, thanks be to God. Yeah, and so I did visit. Mm -hmm. uh, Lenny has a question. Are there any exceptions to not having a spiritual father? Can you allow God to guide you alone? Uh, Lenny, let me ask, let me answer that with a patristic saying. The one who has himself for a spiritual father has a fool for a spiritual father. How's that? That's a basic patristic saying. Spiritual guidance is not a uh, negotiable. It's not negotiable. No one can guide himself. No one who's wise is going to want to guide himself. Uh, it is impossible to make progress if you do not have one in almost anything you do. Can you go to college without a teacher? Can you become a professional without a tutor or, or learn a language without a tutor? Can you can you become a, a carpenter without uh, becoming an uh, apprentice? I mean, there's nothing of any real difficulty and worth that doesn't require someone to initiate you and to teach you how much more the spiritual life. Now, having said that, many people out there, many of you perhaps, have written me and many people are in this situation where they don't have readil, readil, uh, ready access to a spiritual father, right? They're in a far off place. They're in a place where there's only one parish and the priest, for whatever reason, he is not in a position to be the spiritual father. And so they say, well, what do I do? And they lift up their hands. Well, you don't have to have a spiritual father every week or every month. You don't have to see him on a regular basis. You could see him even, I mean, I know people who see their spiritual father three, four times a year max. But they write him, they call him, they go to confession locally, but they go to him once or twice a year or three times a year, depending on the, on the circumstances. And that is a tremendous help in their life spiritually. That reference, that experience, that guidance is going to prove invaluable to them 
And they're going to look back after five or 10 or 15 years, and they're going to say, without that, I could never be where I am today. That's my experience, and that's my experience, experience of many other people. Uh, so I don't think it's a it's, – it's if you're serious about the spiritual life, if you're going to find a guide. Now, having said that, uh, I would say that there is this other – interesting aspect about these times we live in and father Seraphim rose talks about this and we see this in the life of saint paisius veloskovsky who's one of the greatest saints in the last 500 years as far as i'm concerned and he had a basically a brother and they were brothers and spiritual fathers to one another they were spiritual strugglers they were disciples of the saints they they took they had spiritual fathers and they consulted many times other spiritual fathers they knew. So it wasn't they they didn't stay on their end on their own. However, having said that, there are difficulties today. And so you you do make in large part, along with a spiritual father who you might see only a few times a year, the spiritual father, uh, the uh, the saints of the church, your spiritual father. What do I mean? You run to the saints, you run to the teachers of the saints, you run to the, the classics of the church. You run to them for, for to learn about the spiritual life. You don't, don't wait for that 20, 50, hour and a half, whatever it is going to be with a spiritual father to try to figure it all out, okay? Uh, you, you, along with a spiritual father, you have to struggle and to acquire knowledge through the writings of the Holy Fathers and through the scriptures, of course. They go together. Like, there are people who go to spiritual fathers and expect them to get, to have, make them, you know, have progress. <laughs> That's delusional, right? The spiritual father can't do that. Um, you have to take it to him. You have to bring to the table all of your struggles, your your questions, your 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 reading, and and then you're going to have progress. So uh, I don't want to make the spiritual father out to be some kind of panacea where if I have one, everything's going to go well. If I don't, then I'm lost. It's not like that. And yet it is so essential at the same time to have one, along with a fervent and mindful and watchful and 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 a serious spiritual life. Those two things go together. Uh, yes, the spiritual, the parish priest many times can't be a spiritual father, but uh, he can hear your confession. And then you can go uh, a few times a year to someone and you can write and call that person and have them guide you. Um, and that's that's going on all the time. I know spiritual fathers and myself have people increasingly calling and writing from different places uh, to, to get uh, spiritual guidance. So it's common today. And so try to do that. Try to find somebody, even if it's from a distance, uh, even if it's uh, only once or twice a year or whatever it can be, make a beginning. And uh, and I think you'll see uh, the difference. Okay. I think that's, oh, we do have a few more questions over here. Uh, let's see if we can get to those. What, what do we got? Two hours and 31 minutes. We'll go another 10, 15 minutes and try to get these questions answered that I think... Uh, uh no wait a minute let's see if i have any further questions um marco pray for marco he's suffering who is marco john you want to let me know who, who marco is um all right. I don't think I don't see any other questions, so I think we're done. Thank you and God bless you all. Been good. Hope you've had a, a profitable session here. You've learned a lot. Hopefully you've honed your mental skills here tonight and you've uh, made progress in a better understanding of who Christ is, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is coming. Uh, the firstborn from the dead, the faithful witness, and the kings of the rulers, the ruler of the kings of the earth, and 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 our savior. So God bless you. We'll chant the uh, Triparian of the Holy Cross if we have no other questions, and we'll see you on next Tuesday. And next Tuesday, um, we will announce shortly whether it's going to be. It's going to be, I think, something you're all going to be very much interested in. But I'm not going to announce it just yet but stay tuned uh if you have not signed up for patreon check it out consider it just a couple bucks uh, one dollar you can even do one dollar a month if you want twelve dollars a year doesn't matter to me uh, that's the page that's the um uh, 
by God's providence for the time being. We really do want to actually get over to our own pay, uh, platform eventually. We can get away from Patreon. That would be ideal, but it's going to cost a lot of money and time. So we're getting it working up to that point. Uh, we, we do have, uh, let me make that announcement actually, because I know you're all going to be interested in this. Uh, good news. Uh, this afternoon, after <laughs> seemed like endless struggles and endless amounts of editing and endless amounts of corrections, we have finished, 100% finished the all the sections of St. Gregory Palamas's uh, treatise on the procession of the Holy Spirit. We finished it entirely. We have a wonderful introduction. We have a wonderful introduction translation from the 1627 edition. We have a little history about how that was published and what, what, what the first time it was ever published. Uh, we have uh, uh, a portion of uh, Christus' uh, introduction and life of St. Gregory Paul Mas. Uh, and we're going to have an index. Uh, so finally, that's essentially is ready to be page layout. We'll, we'll just have a preface to write and then the index to do. Of course, the index can't. Can happen until we lay the page laid out. So uh, essentially, we're ready to go on page layout. And uh, usually, my experience is, although it's it can vary, uh, once we start the page layout, we can hope to go to press within two months. One month page layout, another month to actually get to the press and get it back from the press and actually circulate it. So it is uh, March, April, May. I would say that finally the uh, long-awaited. Treaties will be in circulation. It's going to be, of course, in Greek, ancient Greek on one side, and modern and, and translation uh, with copious notes and uh, and references uh, on the right. So thanks be to God. We also have a number, a number of other books that are virtually ready for publication. So pray for us. Your support through Patreon actually goes to allow us to uh, begin the publishing again because that's the that's the funds we've had. We had funds we raised through a GoFundMe campaign. We still have those, but. The go the uh, Patreon page is also supporting us tremendously to be able to uh, publish a number of books. We're talking about within 2022. I'm hoping we'll be we'll be able to bring at least 10, maybe 12, or maybe more books to press. Uh, that's going to be uh, you know just a tremendous success if we can get those all to press. Thank you. God bless you, and we'll see you on Tuesday. Well, Thursday night for all of our patrons, and Tuesday again right here. Let's pray uh, and end it with uh, uh, chanting uh, to uh, our Lord. Mm, trying to get it there. Get that out of there.